<laughs> We're starting with just basics of full solar pulled PV. We did uh, photovoltaic, photovoltaics with the electric side of solar. Because the solar, the thermal side of solar is a whole 15 minutes to sell. But the, uh, <laughs> the, the PV side is what I get a lot of questions about because uh, it's the more complicated or it's more complicated in one way and it's more common in another. So we'll, we'll talk about just the nuts and bolts. This is a survey course. Those of you who know this, better stay awake. Um, and we'll try not to go down too many technical rabbit holes in the time, short time we've got here. Um, these are the basic elements in the list form of the solar PV system. The solar panels are modules on the roof uh, and down to an AC inverter. Most, com most common <coughs> installations that you see right now are grid tie only. We'll talk about that in a bit. All of them will have at least this, the solar panel and solar inverters. Other styles will have on-site storage that involve a charge controller and some kind of battery set of some a variety of batteries. And believe me, there is a bewildering array of batteries out there to choose from. Um, but we will hit all of the main points of this as we go on. Okay. The first thing on the menu is solar panels or modules. Uh, we're going to talk about the heavy panels because those are the ones people most tend to, uh, tend to get. Mm -hmm. But there's thin film ones and ones that look like cedar shakes and all sorts of neat things. Most of those are quasi-experimental. The yields are okay, but these are the kind that most people go for. The outputs are better. Um, maintenance tends to be easier. They're a little more, they fit into what we think of when we think of solar. Um, the old type is the monocrystalline type. They are black to rusty black. These are ones you see tons and tons of pictures. These little diamond holders in the corners where the wafers come together are dead giveaways. You're looking at a monocrystalline system. Um, they are less expensive per watt. Uh, for uh, you know, 200 watt panel, you may pay uh, 60 cents less uh, or better uh, a, a watt for them. But this is something that they don't talk about much. But those old, these monocrystallines, when they're new, have a burn in period. Within 6 to 12 months, they will burn into what will be their permanent semi-permanent gem generation level, and they will lose up to 40% of that original generation capacity as the, as the chemicals in the panel age. They will hit that 60% level and stay there almost indefinitely, but you have to be aware that you're going to lose a lot. So you have to buy 40% more at the beginning anyway, which takes up 40% more of your work, 40% more space, that sort of thing. But if you got the space, it might be the thing you want to do. You'll also have to buy 40% more racking and all that other stuff to go with it. So it's something to keep in mind. Um, most of the videos you've seen on DIY panels, how many of you own those videos with the guy sitting at the table soldering wafers together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the guilty has stuck their hands up. I fell for it too. And then, you know, but you get these stack of wafers out of China and you lay them down on the, and you solder them all together and mount them to the plywood and you frame them up nice and you build them. A, a nice monocrystalline solar panel. And it will do the 40% loss thing in that first two years too. But uh, they're a little easier to work with. You can maintain and you can build panels from the way first if you get them. Um, whereas the polycrystalline, not going to happen. These are the new type. Uh, they are well, apparently startlingly blue um, and crystalline. You can see the big patches of crystalline through them. These grids are, um, are a, a real good way to field identify them when you see them. Um, uh, the, uh, generally right now, the capacity on these is guaranteed to have 90% of its original <coughs> output for 10 years and up to 80% and 80% for 25 years. So a very slow burn-in or aging process with the monocrystallines. Um, uh, you just have to make sure you don't do anything to avoid the warranties, like cut the connectors off the ends of the solar panels. If they come with a connector style, buy the, the female part that's supposed to go with it, uh, so you don't uh, so you don't avoid the warranty. Um, it yields more watts per square foot, so if you don't have a lot of space, this is the stuff to look at. Um, and uh, they have increased durability over the old. Uh, some of the monocrystalline wafers are actually very, very fragile. These things are under polycarbonate. They're practically armored. They're really, really tough. Uh, if you're in a hail prone area, these are a great thing to have on the roof. They might even protect your roof. 
Um, the next thing to look at uh, is the AC inverters. Now, there's a couple of different styles of these. But inverters provide AC power by converting DC, which is what your direct current, which is what your solar modules are going to produce, into AC power. Uh, in America, in the United States, at 60 hertz. And no, and no screwing around with that. It's got to be 60 hertz or not. That's part of the UL listing for those devices. Um, the key sizing factors is uh, your output voltage and the rated watts for what you're going to need that, that power to do. Now, um, I might skip ahead here. Let's see. We'll just, we'll just move into order now. <coughs> Three types are out there. Modified sine wave inverters. You can get real cheap watts this way, um, but modified sine wave inverters have some limitations attached to them. <coughs> um, pure sine wave inverters produce <coughs> the kind of uh, AC you get in your house. It's household style AC. Grid tie inverters have a, a signal uh, uh, reading um, relay that <coughs> times that 60 hertz beats with the one that's on the with, this, uh, with the beat that's on the line utility, um, those can have to be in perfect tempo or big things, big expensive things blow up the power company and the firemen show up. Um, <laughs> that's why you don't screw around with cheap grid tie inverters if you do not have the proper listings and the proper uh, UL listings for CSA. Listings. And we'll talk about that. What's your sign? Um, on an oscilloscope, this is what these look like. DCs at a steady voltage. This would indicate how many volts over zero it is. Pure sine wave AC will run positive voltage, negative voltage, back and forth. Modified sine wave is kind of cut up. And you can see it has this moment where it jogs and then goes up, and jogs and goes up, and jogs and goes up. That particular motion is very hard on things like motors, any inductive loads. Uh, your refrigerator will hate you. If you plug in your, uh, if your power supply for your computer, you'll get really roasty toasty on a modified sine wave uh, uh, inverter. Trust me, I know about this stuff. Um, modified sine wave inverters, price is less, good for resistive loads like lighting and heat. So if you've got one of those great little harbor freight play systems, 299, what are they? Uh, 199 bucks, 299 bucks. They're a 45 watt little system you can put in the yard or a charge controller on them and they're cheap to play with. They can run your patio lights, yay! But don't plug drills and weird things in the room like the drill will not like it. Um, not ideal for motors or inductive loads, not good for computers or other sensitive appliances. Okay. Pure sine wave inverters. This is the good stuff. Household type AC. Good for all purpose AC use. So just about anything that has two prongs and wants to go in the socket, that's good for it. Um, purchase price is much higher than the modified sine wave inverter. Uh, something like five to six times sometimes. But we're still not in the big money yet. This is where things get kind of expensive. And where people who do larger installations kind of cheat a little bit. This works with your existing power utility system because it catches that beat, that 60 hertz rhythm from the main utility line and ma makes your inverter match it. The thing is, when that grid cuts out and there's no signal, your grid inverter doesn't work anymore because it won't do anything without that tempo to match. So if you have a grid tied only system, it cuts out when the power cuts out because it's designed to do so. Um, and the, these things are great for the net zero thing or, you know, the kind of you have that, uh, oh, you guys have a system that helps, the Wendell's have a system like this, um, where they have uh, some, some panels on the roof and a grid tie inverter that helps reduce their monthly use for that utility bill because they're producing it on this side. Um, they are very expensive. A, uh, I just priced one out, um, a five kilowatt, um, meter, a 5 kilowatt grid tie inverter was running something like ten to twelve thousand dollars just for the park. Um, if you get a grid tie connection and your leg of the grid needs improvement for you to be on it, let's say you get real ambitious and decide to put in a 15 or 20 kilowatt system at your place and the leg can't handle it, 
ComEd will be happy to send, send you a bill to upgrade their little part of the leg down to the substation to handle it. Mm -hmm. Frank Blacker was very, uh, Frank Blacker is the uh, ComEd contact. If any of you were thinking about doing this, he's the current ComEd com contact for all interconnections. Um, and uh, he was good enough to grace us at the uh, for uh, speaking at the uh, McHenry Wind Task Force meeting this month. And uh, he was very informative about all the little things that can happen with, uh, with grid tie connections. And we could talk about that in a couple of minutes later, which is probably close to it. Um, working with ComEd, uh, you have to get a permit from them to get, uh, get the connection. You need an exterior AC disconnect, and we'll show that in some schematics here in a bit. Uh, something they can get at from the outside, so they can shut off your grid meter from the grid. Um, and you need a UL1741, that's the magic number, listed inverter at the interconnect point. Uh, did I mention this? <laughs> this is very important. He, was, uh, he keeps getting surprised by people who will do this, hook it up to the grid, and then be surprised when, when the ComEd comes knocking on the door going, what are you doing? <laughs> The other thing to note is that the interconnection agreement does not get you into their net metering program. You do have to go through a separate permitting program to get the net metering agreement done. <laughs> the three sell money to sell power to them? Well, and let me address that real quick. For residential users and for users on their own, <laughs> number right off hand, um, but much less than anything you guys are going to be producing from your home. Um, there is no check they're going to write you, pretty much ever. It is a, uh, it is a credit arrangement that they keep. Uh, you run the store up on them, and then they uh, will credit your generation against what you use, one for one. Um, they set it up so that if your power usage is greater in the winter or in the summer, you can take a program that favors you. There's an October to October calendar year and an April to April cal uh, calendar year. So if your big energy use is in the winter, uh, you go from October, let's see, October, let's see what catches what. The, uh, I think it's April to April catches the winter and October to October catches the summer. So, yeah. And uh, so if you're using a lot of AC, you go from October to October in your program. That it's a use it or lose it credit thing. After 12 months, you're, you're your credits drop off month by month. Now the next thing, well those are grid tie only systems. Let me see if I can ask you now. Looks like I lost a, lost a sheet in here someplace. I did build this, and <laughs> so this <laughs> is my... That's <laughs> <point. laughs> <laughs> But, um, okay. When you're when you're done with uh, when you're done with the um, the grid tie stuff, this because these things are all just grid tie only systems. Like I said, grid tie only systems will go out when the uh, grid fails because there's no match, no signal to match, and you, they cannot be persuaded to go back on. They are designed to stay off completely when there's no matching signal from the utility. It's a safety. Thing. Um, but it doesn't mean that if you have one of these systems that at some later later point on the DC side, we can't add charge controllers and battery sets to give you off-grid capacity if you want it. Most of the time when someone goes for a grid tie system, uh, and this is the most common way they're, they're actually <coughs> creating, um, they undersize the grid tie inverter to keep the cost down. They'll put on a 1200 watt or an 800 watt, 1800 watt system just to push back against the meter. It's really all it's there for. They can decrease the size of the generation capacity on the roof and make it small. So you're kind of pushing back against what we're doing to the tune of somewhere between a kilowatt to maybe 1500 watts at max. Okay. But it keeps the component cost down because the minute you start getting bigger and bigger uh, grid tie inverters, those things are costly. Like I said, a five kilowatt one, which will handle a efficiently uh, an efficient house, um, they're like ten thousand dollars if you're trying. Um, these smaller ones, 1200, 1200 watt ones, may run twelve hundred, two thousand dollars. 
for, for the bike <coughs> itself. So that when it's bid out by contractors, that's what you're seeing. They're taking advantage of that economy in parts. But what you end up with is something that will push back against the grid, will decrease your use, but you're going to have to watch your efficiency and cut down on your usage. Now, there are people in this place, I'm sure, that run below the national average of about, I'd say, 900 to 1100 kilowatt hours a month. Look at your. Is it about 800 now? Yeah, that's pretty much. I think it's about the energy efficiency that the lobby is dropping. It used to be about 972, except if you live in the Tennessee Valley Authority area, it was 1200. I don't know why. But I've seen that. Yeah, isn't it weird? Yeah. It's like when you get electricity cheap, you just use more of it, I guess. Is that what it was? But um, that's, uh, that's the, the real basics of uh, what's, in a, what's in an electric system for, for solar. Uh, Kathy Ryland, are you here tonight? Oh, there you are. <laughs> here, she's got solar thermal. I saw her array just uh, just this last week. Uh, five big panels up on top of her place, and she says she's having great luck with it, and it, uh, it's doing great for her. Uh, even provides some of the building heat. Uh, but solar thermal things can get horribly complicated because there's lots of little things you can do with them. You can use direct flow off the roof. You can use compressor-based heat pumps to amplify the heat. Um, you can use it as a preheater for gas, electric, or anything, any other kind of heaters. So they get very complicated. But I kept the best. And uh, here's the mystery slide. Uh, it's a schematic drawn up by a gentleman in California who did a uh, rather uh, well-known DIY system on his home. Uh, he has videos and some other things available on what he was doing. Uh, but this is probably the most straightforward one that's out there, um, showing the uh, PV array, the connection to the uh, DC disconnect, uh, then down to the inverter. Uh, that would be a grid tie type inverter. Um, then it goes to the AC disconnect, um, and uh, that AC disconnect should be on the exterior of the home, as I believe I said, uh, so that uh, the local utility folks can get to it and disconnect it. It should be uh, part of the interconnection agreement that you get from the local utility. Uh, then uh, it goes through on a breaker on the main service panel and then uh, would push out towards uh, the meter, whatever kind of meter the, uh, the local utility requires you to have. Um, pretty straightforward. Uh, the disconnects are there so that you can isolate any uh, portion of the system uh, for maintenance and safety. Very important uh, little thing there. Yeah, and. Uh, would have been nice to have uh, that evening. 